Today, I'm going to interview doctors Matt Hollander and Jason Turowitz, and we're going to talk about the Milgram experiments and morality. I'm super excited for this interview. All right, why don't you guys introduce yourself, and uh, why don't you start, Matt? Uh, my name is Matt Hollander. I am sociology faculty at Marion Technical College in Marion, Ohio, and I live in Columbus, Ohio. And um, my research uh, in collaboration with Jason has focused on Stanley Milgram's obedience to authority work. Uh, and we have uh, published a number of papers as well as most recently a book on this topic. Very happy to be here. Um, so I'm Jason Turowitz. I'm a lecturer in sociology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And I have spent the past few years working on uh, the Milgram experiment with Matt. Um, I have also done research on autism and specifically the way that clinicians uh, determine whether or not to diagnose children with autism. And I have uh, I've also done work on the sociology of race and interaction. Um, so that's my background in a nutshell. Wonderful. So you two co-authored a book about the Milgram experiment, and um, unfortunately, I haven't had the chance to read it. So I'm looking forward to hearing um, the su a summary of the contents of the book. Yeah. Sure. Um, I, I, I would say in general, the purpose of our book is to bring two areas of research relevant to sociology and also social psychology into dialogue with each other, um, two areas of research that are very important, but that have not previously, in our estimation, uh, had much in detail to say to each other. And that is the Milgram paradigm, research on Milgram's topic of obedience to authority in social psychology on the one hand, and on the other hand, the sociology of morality. Uh, sociologists, especially in the last 20, 25 years or so, have had a lot of important research, a lot of important things to say regarding the sociological study of morality. And uh, our purpose in the book is to bring those two areas of uh, research into dialogue with each other. Um, we take uh, an orientation to um, the Milgram experiments, which is informed by our background in sociology, ethnomethodology, and conversation analysis, the detailed study of social interaction, we take an approach which is interactional in uh, focusing on uh, the details of social interaction on many dozens of recordings of the original Stanley Milgram obedience experiments from 1961-1962. Matt was, uh, was able to acquire a large collection of recordings of the Milgram experiment. And although there's been a lot of work done on Milgram, a lot of people have published on Milgram, including Milgram himself. Um, until very recently, no one has actually examined these recordings in any detail. Um, and so people were either relying on Milgram's account of the experiment or on the accounts of the people who worked with him, his assistants, for example. Um, people were uh, responding to others' commentaries on, on the experiments rather than looking at any of uh, the actual data. And what, what we did, Matt did it first for his dissertation, and then we began to collaborate, uh, was to go through these recordings and look at what actually happened during these experimental sessions. And our focus was on how these categories, uh, obedience and disobedience, were actually achieved in interaction. What was it that happened between the experimenter and the participants um, that ultimately allowed Milgram to categorize them as either obedient or disobedient. And in doing that, we, we found that none of the participants were either entirely obedient or entirely disobedient. Everyone complied with the experimenter's directives to some extent. Um, and so a major difference between the people who finished as obedient and those who finished as disobedient is that the uh, the disobedient participants? First off, they they displayed a number of, of resistive practices, so they had a large uh, a large repertoire of practices. But they also were able to sustain resistance uh, over a number of turns until the experimenter finally halted the experiment, rather than acquiescing to the experimenter's directives to continue. Um, and so it wasn't the fact of resistance per se that distinguished the obedient and disobedient participants. It was 
how they did the resistance and whether or not they were able to sustain the resistance. And so, you know, to read Milgram, it seems as though the obedient participants were ultimately reduced to passive instruments of the experimenter as well, right? This is how Milgram describes them. He has a theory, uh, um, the agentic theory of obedience, right? There's something about uh, uh, our evolutionary or evolved psychology that leads us to become uh, agents of a principle when that principle is an authority figure under certain circumstances. Um, what we found is that, that that was simply not the case. Everybody was resisting to some degree. And what we wanted to do was to think about the implications of that for how we understand morality. Because Melbourne was also very interested in, in, you know, whether or not people were resisting on principle, right? Were they invoking ethical principles uh, in their resistance? And he found that a lot of them didn't do that, right? And, um, you know, people would say, well, it, it just seemed wrong to me or the learner was in pain, I didn't want to continue. Uh, they weren't invoking, you know, uh, philosophical principles, uh, any sort of, of moral code. And so, you know, it, it might seem as though morality wasn't necessarily a big deal in these experiments. And uh, another thing we argue in the book is that this is only, this only seems to be the case if you have a rather narrow conception of morality. And so what, what we want to do is actually situate morality and moral practice in the turn-by-turn -turn construction of social interaction, right? And, and when you do that, you can see the way that people uh, are engaging in these resistive practices, that they're orienting to moral violations, to interactional trouble with moral implications. And so they are, in fact, orienting to, you know, the moral implications of their actions, whether or not they make those explicit in the course of their conversations with the experimenter or any other party, right? So it, it was... On the one hand, a question of uh, evaluating the claim or revisiting and evaluating the claim that um, that the obedient participants were just wholly obedient, the disobedient participants were wholly disobedient, uh, and and on the other, thinking about the the implications of that for how we conceptualize, how we understand morality and uh, morality and interaction. Wonderful, well, super interesting. Uh, before we dive any deeper. Can one of you actually briefly explain the Milgram experiment just for the people who have never heard of it before? Sure, I could do that. Um, the Milgram experiment, like we were chatting about a few minutes before we started the interview today, it's uh, uh, the most influential and famous and notorious experiment in 20th century uh, North American social psychology. Stanley Milgram uh, was a uh, new professor at Yale University in 1961-1962 when he conducted this famous uh, research. Uh, the experiments themselves lasted for about nine months from fall of 1961-1962 uh, and involved 23 variations or experimental conditions, variations on the basic experimental situation which involve the following. Milgram had two actors play an experimenter and play a Confederate volunteer, someone who seemed to the research percent, uh, participant, the ordinary person who was the real subject of the research, someone who seemed to be another fellow naive participant, two actors. And in addition to those two parties, he had the actual research subjects for ordinary men and women from the New Haven community Connecticut community uh, aged 20 to 50. Uh, they would come into the basement laboratory at Yale University in the psychology department, Leslie Chin Dem Hall, uh, in order to participate in his experiment, which lasted uh, about uh, an hour, including the post-experiment interview. Milgram was very interested in seeing how far people would go, ordinary, average people aged 20 to 50, men and women from the New Haven committee, uh, uh, New Haven, Connecticut uh, community in the early 60s, how far they would go in simply obeying, perhaps blindly obeying, the say-so of someone who seemed to be in an authoritative position over the situation. The Confederate or actor experimenter, the actor in the gray lab coat, directed them to give electroshocks to the other actor, the so-called learner, in what seemed to be an experiment on learning and memory. Uh, and in reality, Milgram, of course, was interested in seeing how far these naive participants, these research subjects, these ordinary people would go in complying with or resisting that authority figure's directives to go on. Uh, most In the most famous results from the experiment, 23 different conditions, 
in the most famous results that he published, which were based on condition two, uh, he found that roughly two thirds, roughly 66% or 65% of all participants in that condition went all the way to the end of his shock machine in delivering what seemed, what was labeled clearly on the shock machine as extremely dangerous or possibly lethal electroshocks to the ordinary uh, volunteer simply on the basis of the experimenter authorities say so. So that finding obviously has important counterintuitive implications that Milgram was very aware of. We tend to think that our individual characters, our individual personalities have so much uh, to uh, uh, of consequence in whether we ourselves in a situation analogous to that would be among the resistors or be among the collaborators in many situations of, um, of uh, malevolent obedience to authority. And his overall finding really um, was very counterintuitive and shocked uh, not only uh, academic audiences, but also popular audiences ever since in 60 years since that time. And since that time, the last 60 years, we've all been wondering, um, what are the situational determinants that could potentially lead so many ordinary people, regardless of our character and our personality, to become monsters, to become blind, uh, blindly obedient to the dictates of authority? That's what Milgram saw himself as uh, uh, asking and also answering. Yeah, thank you for that summary. Do you want to add something? Yeah, I would. I would just add that this is um, this is sort of happening against the backdrop of the Eichmann trials uh, in Jerusalem, right? And Milgram uh, was ethnically and culturally Jewish. Um, he grew up in New York, and he sort of grew up in the shadow of the the Holocaust, and he was interested in this debate about, you know, why the perpetrators did it, right? Uh, how is it that that uh, ordinary Germans were were led to to collaborate in this mass genocide? And, you know, Eichmann famously said that he was just following orders. He didn't necessarily have any Ill, Ill will toward the people he was harming. He was doing what he was told. Arendt calls this the, the banality of evil, right? And uh, on the other hand, you have a group of people making the argument that, you know, there's something about the German character that was responsible for the events in the Holocaust, right? Uh, the authoritarian, what Adorno famously called the the authoritarian personality, right? What was ultimately behind it. There's something about Germany in particular that made uh, that made Germans more likely to participate in this sort of destructive event. And uh, Milgram wanted to see if he could take ordinary people and basically get them to do things that would ordinarily violate the dictates of conscience, right? Uh, would they behave in an Eichmann-esque way or would they uh, refuse to continue collaborating with the experimenter? And so ultimately, I think he was he was hoping that he could answer this question and that he could do it empirically rather than uh, philosophically. If I'm not mistaken, in the experiment, the purpose of the subject was to read a list of words to the other, you know, the fake participant. And the fake participant was supposed to memorize them and kind of uh, regurgitate them back. And if they made a mistake, that's when the, the subject was supposed to get an electric shock. And then each mistake warranted a stronger electric shock. Am I correct? Hmm. That's right. That, that was the cover story for the experiment. It was sort of a behaviorist experiment in learning and memory that the actor confederate experimenter tells the actual research subject that they're going to participate in. And um, th that would be very hard to do. It, it'd be a strange kind of experimental situation if you sat down at a shock machine and the experimenter told you to read a fairly lengthy list of word pairs, more or less arbitrary adjectives and nouns. And then based on that first hearing, uh, one hearing, uh, another volunteer is supposed to tell you what the correct word match is. And if that other person gets that match wrong, you're supposed to uh, shock that person with um, an increasing um, uh, voltage on your electroshock machine. Um, to me, it, it seems very strange to contemplate that in 2023. But um, this was also a fairly different um, society and a society uh, involving trust in science and psychological science uh, in the post-war decades. Uh, this was 1961, 1962. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, and at least one of the variations, the fake participant 
would be begging the real participant, the real subject to stop, right? They, they would say maybe they had a heart condition or something. And then if I remember correctly, after after the subject administered a certain you know voltage, there would be silence from the other room, right? Mm -hmm. Seemingly giving the impression that that person may have died already or, or at least passed out. Is that, right. is that correct? That's right. Yeah. It's so disturbing. So That's disturbing. Extremely, extremely. And it was, it was very, it was very disturbing for the participants. Um, Milgram in, in, uh, his famous slash infamous first publication on the experiment, he talks about condition two where, um, where 65% of the participants ultimately, you know, went through the end of, of the experiment. And he, he gives this description of participants, you know, pulling their hair, fidgeting, sweating, grunting. Uh, people are really struggling with this. And this this description was very evocative, was very vivid. It uh, understandably sort of set off a big controversy, right? And there were some psychologists um, who, you know, basically demanded that that funding for the experiment be pulled and then it be stopped, right? At, at the time, you didn't have institutional review boards in place. Um, so there really were no formal protocols, you know, for, for determining, you know, whether or not researchers were more harming subjects, right? And, and in fact, the Milgram experiment, uh, along with several other notorious studies, was the impetus uh, behind the creation of, of institutional review boards. And so, so it had, you know, it ended up having an effect on the institutional organization of, of research uh, well beyond the, the findings that Milgram produced and that have since uh, been disseminated so widely in popular culture. Yeah, I'm not surprised that it partly led to the establishment of institutional review boards. I mean, it's just so... It's, it bothers me to think of what trauma the participants, you know, suffer from, you know. Um, so if I'm understanding you correctly, you're offering a new interpretation of his findings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and, oh, um, so the, the question is, you know, why did the, um, why did the obedient participants continue to cooperate with the experimenter? And like I said, Milgram had this theory that they were reduced to passive instruments of the experimenter as well. Uh, there's another popular theory right now called engaged followership, which says that, you know, the um, the participants were not passively cooperating with the experiment and they were actively cooperating with them. They were deciding to go on cooperating with them because they identified with the experiment and with the scientific enterprise because they believed in the export importance of the experiment. And so the ends basically justified the means. Right. And one of the uh, one of the pieces of evidence they cite that people were were enthusiastic uh, uh, collaborators is the survey that Milgram sent out a few months after the experiment asking how they felt about having participated. And uh, a majority of people uh, said that, that they were happy to have been of service. Right. And so <clears throat> this is sort of adduced as, as evidence for uh, the theory of engaged followership. It's it's grounded in identity theory within social psychology, right, that we, we sort of are more likely to cooperate with people with whom we identify on a psychological level and that that's what was going on here. And what we find uh, in going through the interviews, the post-experiment interviews that Milgram recorded with all the participants immediately afterward uh, as part of the debriefing, is that a majority uh, of the obedient participants uh, went on cooperating with the experimenter because they didn't think that they were harming anybody. The experimenter had told them at the beginning of the experiment that although the shocks might be painful, they won't produce any permanent tissue damage um, and no one will actually be seriously harmed. And so when the experimenter asked, why did you do it? Uh, they say, I, I trusted you. You told me that he was safe and you wouldn't have continued if you thought that uh, he was in any sort of serious danger. And so I believed you. And the disobedient participants, on the other hand, virtually none of them said, I went on because I trusted you. Uh, uh, a majority of them said you were telling me to go on and eventually uh, I decided that I couldn't do it any longer, right? So the obedient participants, uh, a majority of the obedient participants uh, were going on, uh, it seems, because they uh, they believed the experimenter, right? Uh, it was a very uncomfortable, ambiguous situation. He didn't seem flustered. He was telling them to go on. And so they went on 
cooperating with him and chalking the learner uh, against his will. And we may, you know, part of the argument is is we draw on uh, on Harvey Sachs, who was a ethnomethodologist and defender of conversation analysis, and he talks about uh, doing being ordinary. He likens being ordinary to a job. So we look for and find things in our everyday experience that confirm that what we're experiencing is ordinary after all, right? Uh, and it's only when we we are faced with strong evidence to the contrary that we may begin to reconsider that. And what the participants are are doing in this experiment is basically making an ordinary judgment about the situation in which they find themselves. They're at Yale. Uh, it's a prestigious institution. This is supposedly a well-credentialed researcher, right? Experimenters will often deceive people in one way or another, right, um, as part of the experiment. And so they are making the ordinary judgment, right, that a competent, uh, uh, well-intentioned experimenter would not allow harm to come to any of their participants, right? And so they're sort of making the judgment that, you know, any person might be expected to make under the circumstances and the disobedient participants all made that judgment too initially. It's just that at some point they stopped believing that the situation was benign, right? A majority of the obedient participants continued to cooperate with the experimenter and afterward they say that it was it was because they believed his reassurances uh that that they weren't seriously hurting anybody now we don't we don't say that their actions were therefore not in any way morally problematic what we do say is that these participants were not behaving in a way that was eichmann-esque right which is the sort of thing that milgram is interested in because in a genocide situation, the perpetrators know full well that they are harming somebody, right? There's a big difference between that situation, the Milgram situation, where the experimenter is telling you he's not really being seriously hurt. This is just uncomfortable. Continue. And you're believing him because, um, you know, because he's he's supposedly, you know, a competent authority figure conducting a benign experiment, right? And so the um, the finding that that trust played played an important role, right? I think compels us to to reevaluate exactly what it is that that Milgram found, right? What 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 were the findings? What is their significance? Um, I don't think that he in fact found that a majority of ordinary people will knowingly harm somebody against conscious and against their will. Uh, because an authority figure directs them to do so, I I think that uh, that things are a lot more complicated than that, you know, and that the participants were engaged actively in interpreting, making sense of, understanding the situation, uh, but not as engaged followers, rather as ordinary participants in a supposedly benign study of learning and memory. Um, so that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is that if you listen to these interviews. Um, the participants are extremely upset in the immediate aftermath of the experiment, and understandably so, um, because whether they thought they were seriously hurting anybody or not, uh, they've still been put through this this terrible process, right? Um, maybe they believed the experiment, or maybe they didn't. But you know, th this was not a comfortable situation, and their first assessment when they're asked about the experiment is is largely negative. And then the experimenter takes them through a debriefing process. And what we show is that in the course of this debriefing process, the experimenter um, either tells them that the learner wasn't really being seriously shocked, um, so that the shocks were harmless, and the learner comes out and confirms that and says, it was my fault, I overreacted. Or in some of the debriefings, uh, the experimenter says he wasn't being shocked at all. He was just an actor. Um, and the experimenter actively works to change their understanding, their sense of what had happened in the experiment, their feelings toward the experiment. So the experimenter will talk about how they were reluctant to continue. They resisted. He made them go on. And so he sort of works with them to um, to reframe what happened as, as uh, action under duress, right? And this ends up mattering um, because if you compare the assessments that people provide right after the experiment, but before the debriefing, right, before the experimenter tells them what the experiment was really about, uh, and afterward, before they leave the lab, they're almost the inverse of one another. A majority are suddenly positive about the experiment rather than negative, right? And so we say that this is the, the, the missing piece of the puzzle. Uh, if the experiment uh, or, or if the participants in the experiment 
uh, were quote unquote happy to have been of service, according to these surveys, two, three, four months later. It's not because of anything that happened during the experiment per se. It's mediated by this debriefing process and the work that Milgram did to transform their attitudes toward the experiment. And so it was the debriefing uh, and the work Milgram did to sort of reframe what had happened uh, that ends up explaining why it seems like participants were enthusiastic about going on with the experiment or during the experiment. No, interesting. There's a, there was a lot to unpack there. So, well, one of the thoughts that I had was how comparable, like now that you've raised certain, you know, uh, certain things with the experiment, I, I now think maybe the experimental design was not so analogous to like the Eichmann case, right? Because on the one hand, there is this powerful and influential leader, right, of, of a nation, and he is wanting something. And you also are, you know, part of this establishment, you know, you are part of the military or whatever. And so I feel like that also factors in as well. So almost like the authority, the power of the authority in the World War II case, it seems to be much stronger than the power of the authority in a, in a lab by a scientist, you know? Mm -hmm. So maybe the that actually pushed the participants it, it was less likely that the participants were going to do something really bad because the authority figure just wasn't that powerful. What we're doing right now is we're um, we're moving from talking about a an experiment in social psychology in North America, 1961, to talking about um, uh, another aspect of history, uh, something which clearly many historians have had a lot to say, which is the Holocaust. And it's that move which I think is so interesting. Um, we, we make a point in the book that, um, you know, there's a lot of limitations and attempts to directly generalize Milgram's findings to anything that happens in the real world in the way that Milgram would have liked us to do. Uh, he did not explain, quote unquote, the Holocaust, in any sort of straightforward or simple or direct way. What, what is going on in that move when we try to make sense of history? It, it's, is sort of like uh, a, a play or a work of literature in some sense. Um, it, it's certainly science, whether that science has certain flaws in it or not. There's there's many um, uh, strengths in Milgram's research as well as many limitations. It's certainly science, but it all, it's also rather literary in, in a way. It's sort of like a play. It's like a one-act play, uh, which gives rise to these wonderful conversations that we're having right now where we would like to um, use the stimulus that reflection on this experiment, uh, this energy is giving us to feel like we have some new insight into aspects of historical concern, like Adolf Eichmann's role in the Holocaust. However, I think it's important to be aware, to be self-consciously aware of this move. What exactly is this stimulus, this uh, heuristic impulse that Milgram's experiment is giving to us? How is it different from uh, simply an act of uh, uh, literature, self-described as literature, as opposed to the work of science that Milgram himself saw himself conducting? So I, I just sort of want to make that observation. Many, many very fascinating and important conversations can be had about the Holocaust and other world war situations of obedience to authority that are stimulated by discussion of the Milgram experiment. Um, and I'd like to encourage all of us to to try to think as clearly uh, as possible about what is going on in that mood. So in, in regards to your interpretation of what happened compared to Milgram's interpretation, are you suggesting that people, that, that the experiment did not show that people are that obedient, that obedience is not that powerful or the or authority isn't as powerful as Milgram made it out to be? Yeah, I think I think that um, that obedience is, is a lot more complicated than Milgram makes it out to be. I think that People, a majority of the the obedient participants um, went along collaborating with the experimenter because they believed his assurances that they weren't seriously endangering the learner. There are also obedient participants. Um, we make a distinction between maximally and minimally obedient participants, uh, which Milgram also doesn't do. Um, and the minimally obedient participants actively tried to stop the experiment. Um, and they didn't manage to do it because they weren't able to sustain their resistance in the way that the disobedient participants were. But they do have a lot of similarities uh, to disobedient participants. So they're a minority. They're about 25% or so of the obedient participants. But 
they are uh, doing what you could gloss as going along reluctantly. They're sort of dragging their feet and they're trying to stop the experiment. They're asking the experimenter to check on the learner. They're saying they don't want to go on. The experimenter is pushing them to go on. That that's not a group for the most part trust the experimenter, right? Um, they're a lot more like the disobedient participants. They do not want to continue, but they're doing it because they feel like they're being compelled to do it, right? Uh, again, that does not look at all like Manesque. That doesn't look like they're they're passively complying or actively and enthusiastically complying, right? When you look at the the obedient participants, right, in this light, um, you see that that there were there were a variety of ways to end as obedient, and there are a variety of reasons I think that people ended up as obedient. Uh, there are participants who say a very small minority that they thought the experiment was important, right? Uh, and that is consistent with engaged followership. If more participants had said something like that. Uh, we would have found greater support in our work for that theory. Uh, as it stands, it's a very, very small minority who say that, but people do say that. Uh, there are people who say that they were doing it because the experimenter told them to do it, and they don't say, uh, also, I trusted you. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't trust the experimenter and they just didn't say it. We can't know either way, but at least on the surface, on the face of it, uh, saying I did it because he told me to is consistent with this Eichmann type interpretation. Again, they're not the majority, right? And so what we find uh, is is what we call um, multiple processes of compliance, right? There are lots of things going on in the experiment, and there are lots of ways to end as obedient. And nobody is wholly obedient or disobedient. Everybody re resists at least a little bit, right? And so to say that we have this dichotomy between the obedient people and the disobedient people and the disobedient people, you know, engaged in acts of heroic resistance and the, the obedient people uh, ultimately just sort of acquiesced to the experimenter and became passive instruments of his will. Uh, and this happened in disturbing majority of cases uh, among the obedient the obedient group um, is is I think a huge oversimplification. And when you when you go back, you know, this is one of the advantages of, of going through the recordings. You can actually hear what happened um, and what it is that's that's going on turn by turn in these interactions to produce a situation that Milgram or an outcome that Milgram could ultimately label obedient or disobedient. Um, and so all of that sort of gets erased in the final classification. You don't see any of that. You just see these outcomes, right? And so in a sense, we're sort of opening the black box and going back and saying, okay, but you know, how, how, did these, how did these outcomes actually come to be? How did they arise? And, and it's a lot messier uh, than it seems to be in the published accounts of the experiment that were produced by, by Milton. Oh, thank you for that. So I, I think it's useful that you added this uh, more specific description of maximally obedient or minimally obedient. Uh, so according to your research, after having listened to the original tapes, how many people or what percentage of participants were maximally, what percentage of people were like in the middle, and then what percentage of people were like minimally obedient? We are using a collection of 117 recordings of the original experiment. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, there were 23 experimental conditions that Milgram ran. We have recordings from five of them. Uh, so we have a collection in short, which is not uh, as large as the original body of recordings that Milgram created. And also we're using a sample which is not random. Mm -hmm. We uh, collected our sample purposively, um, and there were uh, some important reasons for doing that. However, uh, I, I think you know our, our findings obviously have a lot of bearing on what happened in the Milgram experiment. It's a very, very large collection that we have. To my knowledge, it's the second largest uh, collection that's ever been used in research on Milgram. Um, and we spent an amazing amount of time with these 117 uh, recordings. Um, regarding uh, our important, I think, distinction between minimal versus maximal obedience and disobedience, we find that, as Jason mentioned a few minutes ago, in our sample, in our collection of recordings, 117 recordings from the original experiment, about 75% of our obedient outcome recordings were what we call maximally obedient, uh, and the remaining 25% were what we call minimally obedient. Conversely, among disobedient outcome participants, we find that, if I remember correctly, about 65% of disobedient participants were maximally so, about two-thirds, and something like 35% of disobedient participants were only minimally disobedient. And that points, right. among many implications to the point that Jason was just making, 
that although Milgram understandably had a lot of emphasis put on the distinction between disobedient and obedient participants, that was uh, 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 that was the main distinction, the only distinction that he made in, in categorizing participants. We find that uh, counterintuitively, minimally disobedient and minimally obedient participants have a lot in common. There, there, there's there's not um, uh, an enormous amount of differences between the two groups, other than the fact of uh, the factor that Jason was just mentioning, which is uh, the uh, minimally disobedient participants' ability to sustain their resistance rather than backing down and doing so in the way that Milton required to categorize that particular experiment with a disobedient outcome. Yeah. It even after hearing your interpretation of what happened and hearing more uh, more of the details. I'm still disturbed. I'm still disturbed that so many people were so easily worn down by the, mm. the experimenter, right? Because the fact that they resisted says that they thought that they should not have continued. So there was already a conflict there, you know? But if all the experimenter just had to say, like, oh, you know, it's part of the experiment, just keep going. He'll be fine, whatever, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that was enough to dissuade so many people from persisting um, of their objections. And it's just like, I, I still wish that people would set up boundaries and stick to them more effectively, you know, and it's still disturbing that we're kind we're still kind of sheepish. I, it still sounds like we're kind of sheepish. Yeah. It's, it's, um, and that's the thing, right? This is, this is the, uh, the active rather than the passive side of, you know, the, the experiment and our understanding of it, um, that, that participants, you know, all of them, um, are, are resisting to some degree. And I think the, um, the obedient participants who trust the experimenter uh, are struggling, right? It's not at all obvious to them that, you know, uh, they're not causing serious harm to the learner. They're sort of taking it on faith that the experimenter is telling the truth that he can be trusted, right? But this is a struggle for them. And I think that that's exactly, uh, or that's one of the things that ma that makes it disturbing, right? They're trying to find a reason to go on, right? A reason that things are not as bad as they seem after all, right? Uh, that even if they're not being told now uh, exactly what's going on or being shown rather than told that the learner is okay, in the end, everything will turn out to be all right. The experimenter will explain what's going on, right? Uh, they'll discover the learner hasn't been hurt after all. And in fact, that that is what happened. The experimenter does in the end say he wasn't being hurt and the learner comes out and shakes their hand and says it was my fault you know i overreacted right so it, it turns out that that ordinary judgment was actually correct but they had no way of knowing that at the time they were participating in the experiment right so they're making this ordinary judgment about you know what an experimenter would and wouldn't do that does turn out to be correct and yet when they're in this situation uh it's not at all obvious that it's correct or that there's anything benign about what they're doing. And so uh, they're struggling with this, right? And they decide that ultimately the experimenter can be trusted, and so they continue. Uh, there are other participants, uh, that the minimally obedient participants, uh, who are a lot more skeptical, but they, they go on, they're fighting with the experimenter, they're fighting the stop, he's insisting that they continue. And for some of those participants, the only thing that really distinguishes them from some of the disobedient participants is that they don't keep pushing. They ultimately back down, you know, they um, uh, they do it very reluctantly uh, under duress and and they're vocal about that, but they do it, right? And so again, you, you have the spectrum of obedience and ways to end as obedient. And uh, it's, it's the same with ways to end up uh, as disobedient. And, and, you know, I do think, I do think one of the, as you're saying, one of the things about this experiment that makes it so disturbing uh, is that even among the disobedient participants, people do go on to a certain extent, right? It's not like the minute the learner says, ow, after a shock, they stop, right? Even the disobedient participants, uh, virtually all of them go on well beyond that. And, you know, there, there's a point somewhere between 150 volts and I think 300 volts where the vast majority of the disobedient participants discontinue the experiment because the learner's protests get more and more intense. First, he just says, ow. Then he says, I'm not part of this experiment anymore. Uh, then he says, you know, in some of the conditions, I've, I told you I have a heart condition. My heart is bothering me. Let me out. I'm no longer part of this experiment. And the experimenter says, continue, teacher, right? Doesn't respond to the learner at all, simply directs the teacher to continue. 
you know, it's 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 a situation where it's not entire, you know, most people go on to a certain degree and everybody seems to be struggling with what to believe, whether or not what's happening is benign or not. Um, it, it's a really ambiguous situation. It's a really uncomfortable situation. And and I think that um, part of, you know, as I said, the, the enduring fascination in the Pilgrim experiment is that nobody just immediately says, you know, uh, either I'm not doing this because it's inhumane and I'm not going to give these shocks. This doesn't make any sense. Or uh, the moment the learner says, ow, they say, okay, that's it. I'm done. It's, there, there is no, you know, it, it, it's not black and white in that way. And and I think that I do think there's there's so on the one hand there's there's something very realistic about that on the other hand there's something disturbing about that. This just occurred to me. Perhaps your interpretation of the experiment is not that people are blind sheep, but that people are weak sheep. Mm. Maybe right. I because- think a weakness. I think is an important word, and I, I would uh, I would endorse that. It, it, it's been over the course of many many years now of doing this research on Milgram. Uh, the points that we've just been making uh, in the last few minutes have really made a big impression on me. The participants in this experiment, uh, counter to what I personally expected in listening to the details of these, of these recordings, are, are are very, relatively speaking, unforceful and mild in the way that they interact with the experimenter. They, Jason was just remarking a few minutes ago that uh, virtually no one actually gets up and actively seeks to go into the other room where in many conditions the person receiving the shocks, the alleged shocks, uh, or no one attempts to interact in a very forceful physical way with the experimenter. Uh, The strongest form of resistance, as we report in the book, that we find in these dozens and dozens of recordings is people refusing to go on, which is in the realm of possible things that they could have done to stop the experiment, relatively mild. They say, I refuse to go on, but they also, when we categorize this as refusing to go on, they say, I can't go on. I I, I just can't do this anymore, is a very common way in which participants formulate that. Turning to the authority figure who would seem to be directing this harmful situation in which you're seeing on the shock machine generator, you know, a lethal electroshock, seems like a very serious situation. Turning to that person in charge of the situation and saying, I can't do this anymore is important, but it's a relatively mild and to use your word, weak form of resistance. So I think that should give us all pause. Just one more point that I want to make. We do in the last chapter of the book, in our conclusion chapter, sum up what we see as the real world lessons of the experiment. And maybe I can just add one more further point that's made a big impact on me. Um, What we find, uh, among other things, is that it crucially matters that the person who is the victim in a situation like this complain. One major finding is that in the Milgram experiment, uh, the greasy wheel gets the grease. In no, in none of the experiments that we've looked at, do participants uh, and the experiment um, not having first been prompted to remedy the situation by the person receiving shocks. Let me just state that again. In a counterfactual situation, if the person receiving the shocks did not complain, or rather before he started to complain, and everything is going on seemingly uh, okay, in none of those situations did a participant successfully bring the experiment to an end. It really, uh, and this is a major lesson, I think, of the Milgram experiment, uh, and and, and uh, based on that, what we now know in the details of what actually happened in Milgram's lab, it really matters crucially that the person receiving shocks complain and resist in a vocal and dramatic kind of a way for anything to be done. I think there's a lot of real world lessons in terms of the importance of the greasy, of the uh, squeaky wheel getting the grease uh, for many real world situations involving some sort of um, obedience to malevolent or unethical authority. Um, maybe you've thought about this, but I wonder how I would have done if I had been one of the subjects. You know, have you have you thought about that? Do you have any insights? My first reaction, I think most people's first reaction, is to say, um, I either I wouldn't have done it in the first place, um, or you know, even participate in the experiment at all, or I would have stopped it immediately. Um, there's no way I would have continued. Um, 
it's it's as you listen to the participants produce these accounts, right? You sort of try to to imagine what it's like to be in their situation, right? And what is it what is it like to be in the situation where you know, you're being told by one person that they're being harmed and they don't want to continue and by another person that everything is okay, right? And you're like, well, what, why, why would this person who is supposed to be telling me that everything's okay and be so unflustered if everything wasn't in fact okay? And so you're engaging in, you know, some people might say mental acrobatics, right? Uh, to, to rationalize, to justify continuation, but you are um, you are, you know, sort of actively arriving at the conclusion, perhaps again and again and again over the course of the experiment, that what you're doing is not fundamentally immoral, it's not fundamentally wrong, because you're not you're not really hurting anybody, right? Um, and so you're you're believing what you're being told. You can also imagine uh, reaching a point that simply strain where where credulity has been strained enough, and where you think, okay. Um, I just can't keep doing this anymore. And now you're one of the disobedient participants, right? And you simply refuse to go complying with with the experiment, right? Um, and even for the disobedient participants, as I've said, um, they all went along to a point. And so they all need to sort of account for what they did afterwards. So it's not just a question of uh, whether or not you would have gone on, but to what extent would, have you, would you have gone on, right? Not just would I have ended as obedient or disobedient, but how obedient or how disobedient would I have been? And what, what are the implications of that afterward for how I understand and make sense of, of what I did during the course of the experiment, right? Was I weak? Was I being reasonable? Was I doing what any other ordinary reasonable person would have done? Uh, if I'd been asked, you know, to to take a blunt object and strike him with it, of course I would have said no. I just didn't realize I was hurting him. So it winds up being complicated in that way. I think that I think that you know Mil Milgram, uh, he at, before conducting the experiment, he asked psychologists and he asked uh, undergraduate students at Yale, uh, if you were in this situation, uh, what do you think uh, you would do, and what do you think the obedience rate would be? And they thought virtually no nobody would go along with the experiment, all right? Uh, in the abstract, this is a ridiculous situation, nobody's going to go along. And Milgram says this in, in his published work, right? He also says, but look what happens when we actually do the study, right? A large number of people do go along. Um, and so again, I, I think it, I think it, you know, for, for me, in the abstract, I would be one of one of those people who would say, um, you know, uh, in, in a somewhat knee-jerk way, well, well, there's no way I would do that, right? But then listening to the experiment and the participants' accounts, the question becomes, you know, um, not would I or wouldn't I, but how would I or how wouldn't I? And, and at what point would I have said, okay, I just I just can't keep doing this anymore. I refuse to continue doing this, uh, which is what all the disobedient participants ended up doing. You know, I, I would like to say, um, you know, that I would put a stop to it very quickly. But I'm sure that that's something that a lot of these people, you know, if you had asked them before participating in the experiment, uh, would have said as well, um, and and so again, it it um, it's it's a complicated question, <laughs> I would say, um, uh, and and I think it I think it it depends uh, uh, to a large degree on on you know the extent to which you are or not going along with the experimenter, and and if so, how? Um, yeah. Matt, did you wanna? anything yeah uh, it, it's it's a wonderful question um i remember it, it's a question that um over the decades uh countless psychology professors and social science professors have asked their students i remember sitting in the um undergrad class um where i was a teaching assistant at the university of university of wisconsin uh, this was an introduction to sociology class the professor um uh, uh asked that very question in, in a very useful and appropriate way. This is a huge lecture hall of something like 100 or 200 undergrad students. So, um, and, and this professor uh, asked the crowd, in this situation of no obedience, how many of you think you would have been obedient? And people raise their hands or don't. How many of you, on the other hand, think that you would have been disobedient? And I think, uh, although this is a fascinating question um, and a very engaging question for audiences of all sorts, it's a question that trades on for its interest and its compellingness on our investment in our own character, our own sense of who we are as individuals, our own sense of character and personality in a very unsociological kind of a way um, and in, in a way which is not very situational. You know, um, it, It's not really situational in the way that Milgram was very much trying to emphasize situationism in social psychology. And um, in my opinion, uh, uh, another question which is at least as interesting and useful is, 
in a situation which is milk or mask, in which there are a lot of situational pressures to conform, what kind of skills do each of us have for resisting the dictates of authority? Would we say that we're relatively unskilled and we were really at a loss in terms of what we would do in a milk or mask situation? Or do we feel that we're fairly competent and experienced uh, and have some level of confidence and self-trust and our ability to act in the way which we think is best in a wide variety of pressureful situations. Have, what sort of situations of that kind of pressure, possibly milk or mask situations in some way analogous to milk room slab, have we been in? And what have we done? What has been our track record? In a situation where we felt like we would describe ourselves after the fact as having caved in to the dictates of authority, um, what do we wish we would have done? Do we have any models, any people who we admire a great deal for their ability to resist in that kind of a situation where they succeeded in a situation which we failed? What can we learn from them? I, I think transforming this question from individual character to a more situational question about interactionally based skills and practices is a major upshot of our work that we try to highlight in chapter eight and the last chapter in our conclusion of the book. Um, and when we make that a shift in emphasis, uh, uh, I think it provides a lot of reason for optimism for all of us in a wide variety of pressureful situations, because skills are something that can be learned. Some of us undoubtedly are more courageous, more forceful, uh, more effective in interacting with authority figures than others. Um, however, uh, probably for all of us, no matter how pusillanimous, no matter how uh, lacking in social skills, no matter um, how deferent to the dictates of authority, all of us can learn some sorts of skills that may make us feel more confident in our abilities to navigate pressureful situations in the future. No, well said. Thank you so much. I think it's a good time to wrap things up. I think just from like my own perspective, like if, if 10 was totally obedient and one was minimally obedient, I think I would probably fall around like six. You know, ideally, I think I would I would just stop when I heard the other person complain for the first time, but I I'd, I'd probably wouldn't have. It was just basing it off of what I know about my own character. But I mean, who knows, right? Who knows? My guess there, is that I would be a six. There's also, you know, going back to doing being ordinary, right? If you um, if you refuse to go on, right, you assume, you know, from the outset, this is a more or less ordinary situation. Up to a certain point, you could be seen as unreasonable or as paranoid or as uncooperative, right? You know, at some point, it might seem as though, you know, you're jumping to conclusions, right? You have no reason to be the suspicious after all. The learner hasn't complained, right? Or he just said, ouch, once, you know? And and so at what point, uh, if there doesn't seem to be anything overtly, drastically wrong, right? Uh, do you say, okay, I'm done, right? Um, and there's even, I'm thinking of one disobedient case where around 90 volts, it might be even earlier than that, you know, the person does say, the disobedient participant does say, you know, I want to, I want to, I don't think I want to do this anymore. And the experimenter says, well, he hasn't complained. And uh, the person says, no, but if I were in there, I think I would have. And uh, that person does actually end up going on further before they finally put a stop to the experiment. And, uh, <laughs> so it's not like they like they stop it then and there, the experimenter, you know, they stop very soon after. But the experiment does, the experiment manage, does manage to get them to go on in part because, you know, there doesn't seem to be anything drastically wrong, Right. And, and so, it, you know, at what point do you decide, okay, this is not an ordinary situation. This is not benign. Uh, something is, is wrong here and I need to stop it. Right. So I, I think, I think that that's sort of a complicating factor, right? Uh, at, at what point would I have thought, okay, this is something I need to put a stop to. And then what would I have done? Yeah, no, no. Thank you for that. I think it, I think everybody should take the time to kind of reflect on how they would behave in a situation like that. All right. Well, thank you so much for this interview. It was fascinating. I, I just love this topic. The amount of experiment is endlessly fascinating to talk about. So happy to be part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, likewise. All right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.